two, one. All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is a joint Montgomery County Council Committee session of our Health and Human Services and Public Safety Committee uh, to talk about a critical issue that is impacting thousands of residents every year, hundreds of thousands, and that is 911 response and emergency department hospital wait times. Um, for a little bit of context, uh, there was a joint committee session on this very issue last year, and that was after I had had the opportunity to go on a ride along with our colleagues from Fire and Rescue. Um, one of the many things that um, opened my eyes during that ride along was the fact that Code Blue was issued so frequently uh, here in Montgomery County. And Code Blue, for those that are not aware, is basically when there is not an emergency room bed available within our emergency rooms. And so ambulances, um, unless uh, it's an emergency that needs to break through, and this does not minimize our service by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a fact that there is a tremendous disruption and challenges for everyone involved as a result. And I learned that we are more engaged in blue as a county. Um, during that session, we learned a number of things, that uh, Montgomery County is not immune to the challenges that the rest of the country is facing, particularly in our emergency rooms. Staff shortages um, because of uh, challenges with uh, a population that is aging rapidly uh, and because of challenges within our mental health infrastructure as well as substance abuse challenges of a number of our county residents. Um, all of those things together uh, led to some of those ongoing challenges. But as we know, many other jurisdictions across the country face those same issues and yet don't have quite as long wait times as we do. And so the purpose of this session is to get an update and follow up, um, but also on our 911 response times. Um, the state of Maryland, unfortunately, um, has the longest emergency wait room times in the country, uh, and Montgomery County is among uh, the most challenged within the state. And so this is despite some really Herculean efforts, not just of our hospitals, but of our first responders and a number of uh, really dedicated individuals here in Montgomery County. So we're here to better understand what some of the issues are, and most importantly, what we can do about that at the local level or see what we need to advocate for at the state level. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Clemens Johnson uh, to walk us through the packet, but before I do that, I will yield to my colleague and friend, Chair Katz, to see if he might like to make any opening comments as well. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for, for bringing uh, up the topic and for recognizing the very important and very real problem that we have and, and uh, for suggesting the joint committee meeting and for seeing what we can, can do and how we can do it. And I want to very publicly thank those who actually do this work uh, for saving lives on a daily basis, that, that we sincerely appreciate what you do as well and for the people who are in the hospital. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you so we can hear from our guests. Thank you so much, Ms. Clemens Johnson. Thank you, Chair Albernals, and to thank you for the rest of the committee members. I don't have much to add other than what you uh, summarized at the start of this discussion. I want to thank all of the entities in the room for coming and to submitting their information timely, and um, that was all I have to add. Thanks. Yes, please. <laughs> hey, good afternoon. My name is Ben Kaufman. I'm an EMS uh, Operations Battalion Chief for the county. And hi, I'm John Kinsley. I'm the interim fire chief. Good afternoon. I'm Jake Whitaker. I'm director of government affairs at the Maryland Hospital Association. First thought, assistant chief administrative officer of the Office of the County Executive. I also have the public safety, public health, mental health, and homelessness portfolio, which obviously all intersect with this issue. Great. Why don't we start with fire and rescue? Great. Well, I don't have very many comments because I just want to uh, turn this over to Battalion Chief Ben Kaufman here. He's become our subject matter expert as the EMS operations of Battalion Chief. We've been dealing with this problem for many, many, many years, and I just want to commend Chief Kaufman. He's got a really good grasp on the data, um, analysis and presentation of the data. Um, he's been working with the state and our local partners in the hospitals um, to come up with some innovative solutions to this problem. 
And I think uh, all of your questions will be answered when we get to his presentation. So I just wanted to introduce Ben to the council, and uh, when we get to him, we'll uh, take it from there. So great. I'll pass it on to Dr. Stoddard. To, wants to. Yeah, I'll just say, obviously, this is an incredibly complex issue. I think what you're going to hear today is that there are a number of issues that contribute collectively to the challenges that we face in Maryland and, frankly, in systems across the country. And that uh, there is no, there's no, going to be no silver bullet. But there's, uh, frankly, there's some opportunities to make small interventions in a number of different places that additively will have a potentially big impact. And we can talk about some of those later today. Great. Oh, hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Dr. Patsy McNeil, the System Chief Medical Officer for Venice Healthcare. I'm sorry, I'm tired. I had another engagement earlier. No worries. Thank you for joining us. Great. Good afternoon. I'm Jake Whitaker. I'm Director of Government Affairs for the Maryland Hospital Association, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. MHA represents all 61 hospitals and health systems in the state, which combined care for more than 1.7 million people in their emergency rooms each year. Hospitals are open to patients 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and care for everybody who comes to their doors, regardless of their ability to pay. As part of hospitals' missions of care, they continually seek ways to expand access and innovate to increase capacity, including in our emergency departments. Um, we have all heard stories of long wait times at hospitals. We know compared to other states, Maryland has on average longer wait times as measured by federal regulators. Um, this slide shows one of the measures collected by the federal government. The median wait time for a patient who goes to an emergency department is seen and then is discharged in every state. Uh, Maryland hospitals currently rank near the top in a nationwide comparison of the average amount of time patients spend in an emergency department between when they enter and when they discharged. We recognize the significance of increasing throughput and improving access to a timely healthcare services. Um, we are committed to collaborating with healthcare providers and uh, government agencies and community stakeholders to achieve this goal. Um, our hospitals have been vigilant in this efforts to build throughput, but there are significant challenges um, that are out of hospitals' controls. Um, hospital throughput has slowed down in recent years due to a number of several factors. Um, historic workforce shortages in the healthcare continuum the state's behavioral health care crisis, um, inability to transfer some patients to appropriate post-acute care settings, and patients with more complex needs requiring specialized beds and staffing. We know and research confirms that wait times are a symptom of a much larger problem that affects our entire health care delivery system, including a lack of capacity and access to primary care, behavioral health, and other more appropriate levels of care. That said, Maryland hospitals are actively working on these throughput issues. Um, this is a complex and multifaceted challenge that requires a comprehensive, system-wide approach. And so while progress has been made, we know that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I want to thank the chairs of the House Health and Government Operations and Senate Finance Committee for requesting a state hospital throughput work group staffed by the MHA and MIMS. Um, you can see the letters from the committees on this slide. Um, this group began meeting over the summer and will have six meetings in total throughout the end of the year. Um, the work will culminate in recommendations to the state legislature in January. Um, we also know that hospitals cannot solve this problem alone, and MHA has invited a diverse group of stakeholders to come to the table and bring innovative solutions. Um, these partners include state agencies, elected officials, acute care and specialty hospitals, provider groups, behavioral ex health experts, and consumers. Um, our goal is to go beyond the studies of the past and find both short-term and long-term strategies to improve care for Maryland patients. Um, beyond the stakeholder group, the Health Services Cost Review Commission, the state body that regulates hospital rates, has begun the Emergency Department Dramatic Improvement Effort, or EDI for short, in partnership with MHA. Um, the EDI combines public reporting of certain ED quality measures with an MHA and hospital-led performance improvement initiative. Combined, these groups are considering all causes of Maryland's throughput issues, including those inside and outside of hospitals. These efforts come together to address all aspects of throughput challenges and include involvement by state legislators, state government agencies, including the Department of Health and hospital regulators, like the Health Services Cost Review Commission. Um, and while we appreciate the Council's attention to this issue, we would caution against implementing any competing initiatives at this time until the current groups and initiatives can complete their work and submit their findings. Um, hospitals are investing a significant attention and resources are being dedicated to improving throughput throughout the state, and we are committed to keeping you informed on this progress. Um, these efforts include participation from Montgomery County Hospitals, which are represented here today, to talk with you about their unique challenges and priorities. Again, we appreciate your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Who's next? I was going to say, there's nobody for you to hand it off to. Yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, good afternoon again. My name is Ben Call. Just uh, really quick, we have one clarifying question. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. So you mentioned that recommendations were coming to the state legislature in January. Is that the Eddy Project recommendations, or are those separate things? That's separate from the Eddy Project. That's the General Assembly Hospital Throughput Work Group, and that was the work group that was requested by the chairs of the Health and Government Operations and Finance Committees. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Okay, again, I'm Ben Kaufman, assigned to EMS Operations with Montgomery County Fire Rescue Service. I'm a paramedic and a registered nurse, and a good amount of my time is spent working with local hospitals surrounding EMS jurisdictions and our state EMS agency, MIMS, focusing not, on, not only on the clinical care we provide in EMS, but also how we operationalize the transition of care between the field and the emergency department. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I'm honored to be a member of the state work group that is studying our long emergency department wait times. This is the fifth, since, fifth effort since 2007 to study and report back with recommendations on what is ultimately, again, a very complex problem. I'll offer some thoughts and even some optimism about our work, our work thus far and explain what we're doing here in the county. The discussions and handouts from the work group are all recorded and published on a website hosted by Maryland Hospital Association. And I've added two commentary papers to the packet the first is from the New England Journal of Medicine titled Emergency Department Crowding, the Canary in the Healthcare System. And this provides a comprehensive look at healthcare overall and suggests that we cannot look just at ED wait times as the problem. This is much more broad. The second comes from the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine and it's titled Balancing Efficiency and Access, Discouraging Emergency Department Boarding in a Global Budget System. This is written specifically about Maryland's unique hospital reimbursement system and I'll highlight just a couple of graphs that show correlation between the implementation of the budget model and some operational factors here in Maryland. So the model went into effect in 2014 and the left, on the left you see Maryland experiencing a steady increase in the number of minutes that admitted patients remain in the emergency department prior to getting to their bed in the hospital. This is otherwise known as boarding. And on the right side of the screen, you see an increase in the three types of hospital diversion statuses that started in 2014. That's yellow, red, and reroute alert. These are the statuses that the hospitals use to tell the EMS community that, uh, that they're busy in one, one way or another. So we know there is a relationship between Maryland's uh, hospital payment model and the number of available inpatient beds. In fact, the model is designed to promote people to stay healthy and stay out of the hospital and ultimately limit beds per capita. So it's no surprise to see Maryland toward the bottom of this list at 1.82 beds per 1,000 people, which is the fifth fewest in the nation. We know from a previous study that there's a relationship between a shortage of available staffed inpatient beds and emergency department boarding, and that boarding results in reduced available space to care for emergency department patients. So if we graph bed availability with emergency department wait times across the nation, we see correlation between shorter wait times in the emergency department and having more beds per capita, and then states with longer wait times having fewer beds. And the better states are, uh, the better performing states have over 2.5 beds per thousand people. If we look just at Montgomery County, we have 1.26 staffed beds per thousand people. And while that seems extraordinarily low, I'm illustrating a correlation, and we cannot say that this is the single cause of emergency department wait times. And I'll point out that from an EMS perspective, Montgomery County emergency departments are actually performing quite well overall. We can also look at this in terms of occupancy percentage, and this is likely a function of the efficiency imposed by the total cost of care model here in Maryland, in that the, we have the highest occupied bed percentage in the country and also the highest emergency department wait times. Uh, this and the the slide that was formatted in a, in a similar way or created by Dr. Peter Hill from Johns Hopkins, who serves with me on the work group of the state. So I provide all this as background on some of the things I've learned on the work group, and the takeaway being that no one thing is going to fix this. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we've discussed is the difficulty that doctors have discharging patients who aren't going home from the hospital. 
patients who need to go to some level of subacute care, like a skilled nursing facility or a behavioral health inpatient facility, can get stuck at the hospital because there's simply no place for them to go. And this backlog contributes to the boarding problem in our emergency departments and leads to protracted emergency department throughput times. I foresee a series of recommendations to come out of the work group to address various aspects of Maryland's health care system that we know are ultimately tied to emergency department waiting. So the HSCRC EDI project that Mr. Whitaker talked about uh, is promising because for the first time state agencies are paying attention to ED waiting on a per hospital basis and publishing data. MEMS is also sending emergency department or EMS wait times to, the, to each hospital each week and this is a big first step in identifying the problem and hospitals are taking notice. I've included the most recent EDI report in its entirety in the packet. This is an example of the data that HSCRC is sharing. So it's a breakdown of ED wait times by hospital, and I've highlighted our six county hospitals here. Uh, my impression is that this the program is new overall and that hospitals are actively working to improve. So by the end of this year, we should have a reliable baseline. Uh, and there may ultimately be some financial incentive to the hospitals to improve wait times based on uh, what we're seeing here, including the, the EMS wait times that you'll see in the packet. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk, uh, talk about this from the EMS perspective and kind of the, with the work that we're doing here. This is a map of the county uh, showing our six acute care hospitals. <clears throat> and this is year over year data looking at our EMS volume in MCFRS and in calendar year 2023 we are on track to handle more patients than we've ever we've ever handled before we're transporting about 200 patients a day to the hospitals um, our EMS volume is higher uh, and we are more regularly hitting these surge triggers that we keep an eye on to tell us that our transport units are running low and when we get one of these triggers we look for the cause whether it's a spike in demand from maybe one major incident or multiple incidents in one particular area or we look to the hospitals to see if there's a diff if units are having difficulty clearing out of the emergency department. And the good news is that these EMS surges do not seem to be correlated with widespread turnover delays. They do seem to be related to spikes in demand, and so it does not seem that the uh, EMS waiting at the hospital is a problem. Um, and I'll point out that our relationship between EMS and emergency departments is very good. We are unified on being focused on quality patient care and also keeping our EMS units available to serve the community. This relationship is established formally through an EMS advisory council, we call it McKendisac. It's between us in the EMS leadership and the emergency department leaders. We meet every other month and formally, but then we also have regular ongoing conversations between the leadership. <clears throat> you might wonder why we care about uh, emergency or EMS uh, wait times, hospital wait times, throughput issues. But if you look at this from the EMS perspective, there's no productivity when an ambulance is at the hospital waiting to turn a patient over. They're unavailable to run another call. They're caring for that patient until there's a, a spot to put them in the hospital. If we left this unchecked over time, and there are agencies around the country that uh, don't focus on this the way we do, you see that they actually need more ambulances to be able to meet community needs. And there's, um, we're talking about places that have ambulances waiting at hospitals for 10, 12, or 14 hours, and thankfully that's not happening here. And finally, it decreases patient satisfaction clearly, right? So through our relationships, what I tell the emergency department leadership is that we will not normalize long wait times here in Montgomery County, and that EMS crews won't act as surrogates for emergency department staff. And this is a regular ongoing message. If you think about this from the hospital's perspective, as soon as the patient arrives in the emergency department, they are the responsibility of the emergency department staff. They're no longer EMS uh, in the care of EMS. So there's some level of security when an EMS crew is standing with the patient, but they are the hospital's responsibility. And finally, we remind emergency department staff to uh, send a stable patient who's already been assessed by EMS. If they're perfectly fine to wait in their waiting room, we send them out to the waiting room that just because you arrived by ambulance does not mean you're getting a bed right away. Uh, the, the charge nurse is tasked, among other things, to triage everything that's happening in the, in the ER. And if a very stable patient comes in by ambulance, they'll go out to the waiting room. <clears throat> what really makes this work is our EMS field supervisors. So we have three working 24-7 in the field that, among responding to the highest acuity of calls and conducting training and oversight for the EMS crews in the field, they are uh, serve as liaison for each of our hospitals. So each of the supervisors have two hospitals that they work with, and they are in constant communication with the charge nurses to not only monitor conditions in the ER, 
but to handle any of those long wait times that might come up throughout the course of the day. <clears throat> On top of that, we have an, a clinical disposition officer that we call EMS 700. This is uh, an EMS supervisor who works at the communication center that's constantly monitoring EMS resources, uh, monitoring the status of the hospitals and getting real-time updates from the hospital to know what the conditions are in, in the ER. Uh, and then on a call-by-call -call basis, they're having conversations over radio with the crew to figure out what's going on on the scene and to make a destination decision in collaboration with the patient and the EMS crew to find out what the best place is at that time for that patient. This is the desk where the EMS 700 works at the communication center. Um, I'm going to go through some slides here that talk about time intervals, so it's important to define them overall. So we look at three distinct times. One is the cycle time, which is the entire interval of an, of an EMS call from the time of dispatch until the unit is cleared all the way at the end of the call. And then the drop time is, is defined as from the time of arrival at the hospital until they've cleared the hospital or been available for another call. And then lastly, turnover time, which is this, the smallest interval that we, and also sometimes the most difficult to measure, which is arrival time at the hospital until the patient has been transferred both physically and a warm handoff is done to the staff. Uh, and that's called the turnover time. These are some of the metrics that EMS 700 and the EMS crews in the field will use in real time to make decisions about their destination. So on the left, you see a dashboard that tracks not only county units, but also our neighboring jurisdictions to see where the ambulances are uh, in terms of their destination, a hospital destination, either whether in route or arrived at the hospital and the duration that they've been in route or arrived at the hospital. And then we have dials that keep track of our unit availability and when these uh, these are the things that monitor our surge triggers. So when we get to a certain level of EMS uh, units being on calls, we'll get alerts via text message. The dashboard on the left is a state version of the one I had on the previous page. This looks at statewide. I think virtually all counties in the state, maybe there's one or two that are missing, uh, per, per, uh, participate in this AHA or at hospital ambulance dashboard. And then on the right side, you see an example of a text message that we would get when we're hitting one of those trigger alerts. We also, as a safeguard, when an ambulance has been at the hospital for an hour and a half or more, we get an alert, widespread alert to all of the supervisors to say an ambulance has been at the hospital for a long time and requires action of the supervisor to figure out what's going on, why, why has the ambulance been there so long. And you can see uh, we were running, this is a per week graph at the bottom, we were running these uh, you know, set, you know, 30 or 40 a week at one point and that's come way down since we've been paying attention to this over the last year or so. What really makes this work is in the real-time information that we get from the charge nurse to EMS 700 and to the EMS supervisors. This is updating us on conditions in the hospitals throughout the course of the day. We ask for a couple of objective points. We want to know how many patients are boarding in the emergency department, their open ICU beds, their open ED beds, and then a subjective evaluation of the pace, whether it's light, busy, but manageable, or very busy. And then we allow them to put some notes in. And this is really that constant feed of information that lets us make really good decisions on uh, hospital destination. And just a couple more graphs here. So this is the drop time, which uh, is, this is, happens to be a, a weekly uh, measurement. <clears throat> so from the time an ambulance has arrived until it's clear and we shoot for a goal of 40 minutes um, and we are in, the, in terms of the median drop time, we are meeting that goal at like 38 minutes, just uh, most recent report. And then we have a 90th percentile at the bottom as well. The cycle time, though, is really what you think about in terms of how long does it take in the, an ambulance to run a call overall. Uh, this is where the dollars and cents figure come in, so we look at this more broadly, so on a monthly basis, again, we're doing quite well with a goal of 75, and we are meeting that goal for the median. So understanding that this is, this is a broad problem overall, I'll describe some of the programs that we've attempted here in the county. So we're partnered with both Kaiser and MedStar Urgent Cares to accept EMS patients. Uh, they are perfectly fine in ongoing arrangements that all, uh, but we've found that we, they really have limited use here in the county. Folks who call 911 are generally more, ex, uh, require more extensive assessments and uh, treatment that can be provided at an urgent care. And then we found that some urgent cares have limited hours and limited capabilities based on a number of factors, including staffing, which I'm sure we'll hear more about today. Urgent care centers are not part of the state hospital system and they aren't held by the same federal regulations that govern our hospitals and our freestanding. So you hear a lot of talk about, well, maybe patients should go to urgent cares instead of the hospital. 
it doesn't really work. We tried it. We also partnered with a physician group in an attempt to provide treatment in place via telehealth call initiated by us after the 911 call. And that program was used very, very rarely, and we actually ended that at the end of calendar year 22. So we started these programs thinking that by diverting folks with a minor complaint away from the ER, that we'd be able to free up some space for people who really needed to be there. After operationalizing this, we realized that minor issues really aren't consuming the same resources as somebody who falls and breaks a hip or has a complex medical problem. In reality, a person with a minor injury like a sprained wrist is usually going to get assessed and treated from the waiting room and discharged from there without ever laying in a hospital bed at all. So <clears throat> what we're left with is opportunity to target populations of patients who do take up hospital beds and patients who are, I'll give you a couple of examples, patients who are already in a bed at a nursing home who can potentially be provided some higher level of care without being moved to a hospital. And then we have patients who present with primarily behavioral health concern who should be managed in a specialized facility rather than an emergency department. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Dr. McNeil, did you want to make any comments? Mm -hmm. I have a slide yes, well. perfect. If you could press your button. Thank you. No worries. All right. Um, is there a clicker? Yeah, it's coming down. All right. Ali's, we'll wait till after. Yeah, All right. Like I said, you're going to hear some of the same themes. My colleagues have spoken to um, are exactly what I'm going to say has happened. But I'm going to thank you. I'm going to speak from the point of view of uh, the Montgomery County Hospitals. I am an emergency medicine physician by training. I'll say that up front. I've been an emergency medicine physician for about 27 years, all of which has been in this region, the majority of which has been practicing in Montgomery County uh, as well. So there, I'm breaking this into categories of, of what the challenges are that are impacting this issue, and uh, there are multiple ones that have once again been referenced already. So if you think about the, um, the milieu of the emergency department, there are several things. People often think, well, are there enough physicians? And there is a shortage that's going nationally. Some of the unique um, uh, construction of Maryland makes physicians be even more short here than in many other states around the country. So if you think about it, um, number one, Maryland physician compensation is the lowest in the nation after Mississippi. All right, and so we are really underpaid compared to some of our compatriots, even in Virginia and D.C., and so they have the opportunity to go elsewhere to work. That's emergency medicine physicians, but it's also other specialties as well. So um, physicians also trained in Maryland tend to leave Maryland at a higher rate than other states, and so we have great uh, institutions here in Maryland, Hopkins being one, Maryland being one, uh, but other than two states, physicians who are trained in Maryland have a tendency to leave at a higher rate, which also gets us behind as far as the physician supply uh, within the state of Maryland. Um, because of all of these two these factors I've mentioned, that means that when you're an emergency department physician working in a milieu of the emergency department, there are wraparound services that make you more efficient in getting patients through the emergency department. One of those things is specialists that you're going to call. If there are no specialists to discharge somebody to follow up with and no um, specialists to call to guide you through some of the specialty portions of patient's care, it makes it longer to get that patient through the emergency department because you have to think on your feet, as all emergency Martin doctors do, but even more so a little bit further outside of your expertise level when you usually would be able to just call someone and say, the follow-up in two days and have these medications. So it's a little bit more complicated than it used to be to practice here. Um, also, someone also alluded to this, there's a primary care shortage as well. And if you are a patient who can't get into your primary care doctor, you go either to urgent care or if you really are concerned, you go to the emergency department. And the thing is, if you don't, you don't have a primary care doctor uh, in, in good time to be seen, that means you may be presenting to the emergency department sicker than you would have been or further along in a diagnosis than you would be. And then once again, it bounces back up to the other things on this list, which means the specialty care that you're going to need to have uh, may be less than is ideal to get somebody diagnosed, treated, and through the emergency department quickly. So that physician shortage 
uh, issue, there's a wraparound issue that's not as simplistic as, for instance, it's just the emergency department doc who's not fast enough or there are not enough of them. It's a wraparound uh, issue as far as supply. Bed capacity I'm going to talk about as well. There's been a lot of data shown already, so I'm not going to harbor on that too much, but as a comparative, you know, Maryland has about a little over 6 million people in the state. When you break it down by folks using our, our hospitals, there's a little over 10,000 acute care beds for 631,000 discharges, and so 168 beds per 100,000 people. A similarly sized state as far as population is Missouri, and they have 81 beds, so more than 50% more beds for that same population of patients who are in the, the uh, hospital. And when you go ahead and do the math walking down, that means they have over 100 beds more per 100,000 people who are in the hospital. And so, of course, their throughput issues are going to be different than those that we have in this state with the restricted number of beds that we have because of our health care model. Behavioral health is also alluded to. I should have put the, uh, the slide up here, but there is a review for the United States that looks at uh, medically underserved areas. If you look at that map for the United States, the entirety of the United States is underserved as far as mental health resources, and we are no different. So there is a huge capacity limitation of those uh, behavioral health patients. And so when my colleagues in EMS drop a patient off in the emergency department, who hasn't had wraparound care outside of the hospital, who is heavily, heavily acute, they often take a lot of the resources of people, medications in the emergency department, and they tie up beds for a long period of time, as well as people, because there's no place to put them quickly. And so that becomes a huge issue, not only because that eats the bed and slows down throughput because the bed is missing and people are treating those folks, but it also, uh, you know, is, is a significant issue because those folks are not getting the type of care they deserve for mental health in an emergency department environment as opposed to a behavioral health environment, which is where they should be. And they often sit for hours and hours in those beds before they can be placed. So a lack of psychiatry resources in general means that those patients sit in the emergency department for, for longer periods of time. There are also um, narrowed populations that aren't high in number but heavily resource uh, intensive if they land in the emergency department beyond just the um, behavioral health patient that we're used to seeing when we have depression or schizophrenia and so forth. There are adolescent geriatric and neuropsychiatry patients who land in our emergency departments. There are so, so very many, uh, very few beds in the state for this particular narrow focus of folks that they can stay in the emergency department for not hours, but days to weeks to multiple months, if we're not careful. The neuropsychiatric patients, there aren't a lot of them that hit our emergency department, but they can stay for, for, we've had for 90 days or longer at times because there are only four beds, I believe, in the state that serve this population. This type of patient as well, once again, takes a lot of resources because anyone who would be in a single room for three months would have a challenge handling that, and this patient population really doesn't have the mental resources to be able to handle it at all. And so violence occurs. It's a really large, um, uh, expensive time and resource to take care of these folks in the emergency department. Um, and then we have adolescents who really don't have any medical or mental health issues, who either parents or group homes or others cannot handle their uh, behavioral challenges. They are placed in our emergency department. We, of course, are going to take care of them but then uh, often the state does not take those folks to other homes, and so we take care of them in the emergency department, which would be fine, except for it takes, takes beds, which we need to use to take care of the people we're trying to get through the, the emergency department. Um, now, having said that, it's not as if we don't, hospitals, Advanced Healthcare and others don't work with representatives to try to get folks around, and we will keep them safe if there's nowhere else to go, but ideally they should be placed appropriately with the state resources and work with them, trying to get them out of being stuck in the emergency department. All right. Let's talk about workforce. I've already talked about the physician uh, resource, and there's been in the pandemic a lot of focus on the nursing resource, which we actually, I think, across the county improved as far as the nursing resource is concerned, although it's still a concern and a focus for us all. 
Um, but there's a national health care um, workforce shortage. So you know, there's a physician and a nurse, which we all know about taking care of patients. But there are other services, of course, that need to be in place to take care of patients. You know, if you have all the physicians and nurses in the world, but you have no x-ray techs, you, you still can't take care of folks like they need to be taken care of. There's housekeeping. There's, there's people who need to be fed. And so there's a lot of wraparound services when you take care of a single patient or many patients that the national health care workforce um, uh, is, is just not really where it needs to be to take care of these folks um, adequately. We've talked about inpatient capacity as well. There are definitely hospitals within our area where the, the capacity to take care of them for the community is just overwhelming for the physical resource uh, that is there for that area. Um, alluded to is post-acute capacity, meaning that our, our nursing homes, our home health as well, that resource will keep folks in place in the hospital when they could have been discharged, but they cannot go home. And if they cannot go home and they cannot go to, you know, there is no available uh, nursing home facility that's available to them, they're going to stay in the hospital, which means that if they're in the hospital, those beds that are occupied can't be occupied by people who are in the emergency department. And so it's a stacked problem when we don't have the capacity on the outpatient uh, side, or post-acute side. Also, the community, I would say for Montgomery County, amongst the con counties I've ever lived in or worked in, has more um, uh, resources for the community than many places do. But there are small types of patients that are difficult to place in which there are not resources at all. And that, once again, not only eats up hospital beds, it eats up the resource of the people who are having to take care of them, taking away from other patients who need to be throughput through the hospital as well, if that makes, makes sense. All right, now what are hospitals doing to address these changes? They're going to see a lot of things that in Montgomery County, I, I know my colleagues are doing as well. There are more than this. I'm, I'm listing what I know, but every hospital has their things that they're also working on separately. Um, so there are, on the outside, collaboration to develop statewide solutions. There's a general assembly work uh, group that was referenced. There are MHA policy work group that's being done as well. There is performance improvement collaborative with the HSCRC and MHA, the Eddy product that was referenced as well. There's Nexus Montgomery Initiative, which is a great resource here in Montgomery County to do all the things that you see there as far as advocacy and work to expand the ability to take care of some of these harder to take care of patients that I've referenced as well. But there are hospital-based initiatives. As far as a physician resource, either um, employed or national groups are used to make sure that the emergency departments around the county are well staffed, and they are. Um, physicians actually like to live and work in Montgomery County because of usually of family reasons, and it's a great place to live. So Montgomery County, the physician resource for emergency departments, is a little better off than many. It's the specialty resource that sometimes um, suffers. Um, uh, initiatives about transfer as well, which is very, very challenging. MedStar is really um, fortunate because they have this complex transport system. The rest of the hospitals within Montgomery County actually don't have that, and so we're relying on private um, companies to do our transport, which sometimes if you need to be transported from point A to point B, it can be 10 hours or more because of that resource being overwhelmed to get from one place uh, to another. Um, each hospital has definitely data-driven ways to look at this problem and try to cut it up so that we can make sure we can attack all of the multitude of problems that can be fixed to roll up together to make sure that we do improve uh, hospital uh, throughput. And there are work groups that in every hospital that I've ever actually been in, but specifically here in, in Maryland to try to improve this. Um, bed management systems, the so software and computerized ways of knowing what patients are in what beds at all times uh, and how to make sure that, for instance, Housekeeping goes to those beds as soon as somebody's discharged to make sure that it is optimized to get the throughput in the inpatient and in the emergency department done very efficiently. Um, and of course, discharging people um, efficiently. There are uh, waiting room areas in the hospital in some places where discharged people have them wait for their families to pick them up so that the people can come into those beds and get them through more efficiently. While they're there, they get educated about what their care is going to be on the outpatient so they don't return to the hospital uh, as, as well and get readmitted. Um, leveraging 
care navigation social work. So even the most well-resourced people, it is complex to be a patient, and it's complex to know what you should do once you're discharged. I am a, a physician. I've had family members in the hospital, and I've had to stop people like, slow down. <laughs> what are we doing again? And so that is something that we do very carefully, but it takes well-coordinated care navigation and social work to help the entire spectrum of, of patients, no matter how sophisticated they are or are not. Uh, in addition, as far as the workforce is concerned, um, international nurses have been a boon. I know they've been in healthcare in across Montgomery County as well to bring their expertise and their, their um, fresh perspective to taking care of patients, but also to fill holes in which we, can't, we don't have nurses. We align very carefully with nursing uh, schools, with high schoolers, um, we have a nurse residency program, often in hospitals, to get them trained up very well. Collaborating with MIMS and uh, EMS to improve ambulance turnaround times and make sure that's done efficiently as well. And uh, make sure we have care models so that, as was alluded to, patients who have, an, have a sprained ankle are treated from the emergency department or an alternative space than the main emergency department to get them in and out so that we can focus on those that are higher acuity and require more resources uh, as well. So in closing, I'm going to say what's been said um, several times here, but capacity, capacity, capacity. If we had more hospital beds, this would be, I believe, less of a problem. It's not only that. It's multiple things, but that's the easiest fix, number one. Um, I would love to see us create a more incentivized, palatable place for uh, physicians to work. Uh, I say that because it's not only about now, but as you know, it takes a long time to train one of us. we um, got a 10-year lead on this, and so I, we really do need to think about ways to make it easier to open a private uh, practice office in Montgomery County, for instance, so we can have that resource here. Um, and just in general, we need to, to grow that healthcare workforce. We're starting in high school and colleges at this point, trying to get folks to think about going into healthcare, whether it be to be a physician or a nurse or a tech or a social worker. It's really important that we have those upper own services to take care of the human beings that we have to take care of. Now, I have other colleagues here I know, so I don't want to be the one sole voice of Montgomery County uh, hospital systems, but, but that's a general overview of how it's approached. You're doing a good job. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Sure. Um, Dr. Starr, did you want to make any final comments before turning it over to my colleagues? No, the one thing I will say is, um, obviously, I, I hope at some point we will talk a little bit about the Diversion Center as another opportunity, particularly for mental health patients, where we're looking to uh, have a county resource to move people out of our EDs who are in need of mental health services, but that's another thing to add to this conversation. Obviously, we're moving forward with that. We've begun a stakeholder work group with community members to really get their engagement. I'll be preventing, uh, presenting before the Rockville City Council this evening on the same issue, and so we're really trying to do this as a community-based project, and you will, I would expect to see that in the capital improvement plan uh, really more fleshed out when it comes across. I will also add to say that, you know, one of the things we originally started out as a, um, you know, a walk-in opportunity, we've now moved it away from that, but I do think that we are looking at a walk-in opportunity of a similar type that is another capital project that we're just really starting to getting the planning out for. So you may also see that again uh, later this year. Thank you. I appreciate that. I had a couple of comments. I'm going to turn it over to colleagues. Um, colleagues, just let me know if you'd like to speak. Okay. Um, so this is sobering, uh, clearly, and, and I was not aware until you presented, Dr. McNeil, where we fall in terms of pay for physicians, because we have so fo much focused on, understandably, within our nursing profession, because that's been such a shortage. And the county has stepped up. We've provided supplemental appropriations to our hospitals. We have uh, initiated the Black Physicians Network for our minority health initiatives and program. We're trying to expand the reach. Um, but clearly, we need to do more. And I just, from the hospital's perspective, on especially on the pay structure, could you elaborate a little bit more on that uh, and what some plans are maybe to help in that regard? Yeah, this is a very challenging issue because as the physician resources shrunk, of course, it's the supply and demand and the, the expense. We've become very expensive people to have around because of that supply and demand difficulty. For the hospitals and healthcare systems, you know, there are many who employ a certain focal group that are hard to resource, for instance. Adventist Healthcare has just employed their radiologists, which is a very hard group to resource. We've employed our cardiologists, also another group that's hard to resource. And so there's strategy behind making sure we employ people and pay them at a, a fair wage and make it easier for them to, to go about their day, right? 
the, the private is, is where it's difficult. When I say private, I mean those doctors who have their own businesses in healthcare on the outside. And um, physicians keep their head down and work. And that's, that's what they do in general. And some of them have business expertise and some of them don't. But there isn't a lot going on because there hasn't been a lot of attention to this. Um, I wish I had different graphs to show you about, for instance, the United States versus other countries, how we, uh, uh, you know, educate and, and pull out you know, nurses, you know, at a level that is much lower and slower than the rest of the world as far as physician resource. Speaking of Montgomery County, I would love to see some incentivization for people to make it easier for them to have offices here than anywhere else because that's going to bring people in because if the business makes it easier and much more palatable for them to do that, for instance. But you know, hospitals are doing what they can with the limited resources they're allowed as far as their revenue generation, and they definitely understand that it is a stressor and a need, um, but there's a limitation of how far we're going to be able to go with that. Gotcha. Um, so my friends in Fire and Rescue, I know last year we had discussed the launch of a pilot to see if we could divert some patients who were calling 911 to urgent care, but it sounds like, understandably, that has limitations um, for, for obvious reasons, but I appreciate the effort. There was also an effort to look at, and this is probably true of the hospitals too, but telehealth and telemedicine uh, as one of a complex way of potential opportunities to help minimize people actually seeking emergency room visits. And I'll often use my own family as an example. I'll do that again right now. During COVID, uh, my then seven-year-old son was messing around with his older sister, uh, hit his head, and we were concerned he had a concussion. So we contacted his pediatrician because this was in the middle of COVID when everybody was telling you, please do not go to the emergency room unless you have to. Um, and so we called our pediatrician. Our pediatrician uh, did a virtual appointment uh, and checked him virtually and determined that he probably didn't need to go. We probably would have gone on our own had we not checked in with our primary care doctor in advance. And so there, multiply that by how many ever thousands of uh, potential intervening opportunities before somebody goes to emergency room, because sometimes you don't know if you should go or not, um, or if you should wait until the next day. So I'm just curious as to has telehealth and telemedicine reached a point where maybe that's an asset that we might be able to better leverage to address and deviate some folks who don't need to be in an emergency room from being there? From the point that they've called 911 and we've arrived on the scene, we have attempted to identify a subset of patients who would be suitable to stay at home. And for a variety of reasons, it, it didn't work for that particular population of people who call 911 generally either want to go to the hospital or after we've initiated the telehealth call with the physician, there's some level of risk aversion on their end and they def defer us to transport anyway to the hospital. But very low success even when we were able to establish a, a solid relationship with the physician over our telehealth line. Uh, yeah, I, I think the efforts there to, uh, you know, when Mr. Whitaker pointed out the input, throughput, and then at the output issues those uh, of, of hospital throughput overall, Focusing on the input, I think, is important, but not so much on the lower acuity, like like you described, your your son. That uh, you know, there, there were, even if you had ended up in the emergency department, it would probably not have been a super complex visit to the emergency department. Uh, you probably would have been treated and may may have not ended up in a bed in the emergency department at all. It, hospitals have adapted the same way we have adapted to the volume, and patients are getting care in the waiting room. They're, they're calling it vertical care st structure, and you don't ever end up into the, into the hospital. So, gotcha. Yeah. Just, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. What okay. is the we have some leaders from some of the other hospitals in Montgomery County. Could they maybe join the Yeah, that's fine. Discussion? That's great. That's great. That's great. Thank you. How long could they go to mm -hmm. that? Uh, I will also say that, and no, at least for Venice Healthcare, we are looking at, at telemedicine to help be that urgent care lead to then help divert from the emergency department and then divert toward our, for instance, private uh, physicians to help them stay out of the emergency department as well. We're early in the stages of doing that. I don't know if my colleagues have had similar experiences, but, you know, as an emergency medicine physician, there's a lot of people. I get calls constantly right. because somebody's seven-year-old hit their head right. or whatever, and that's definitely something I think would be useful. Absolutely. If you could introduce yourself. Hi, sure. Hi my name is Lou Damiano. I'm an anesthesiologist by trade. I'm the president of Holy Cross Hospital and Holy Cross Germantown Hospital. And the reason I wanted to join is I wanted to add on to what my colleague, Dr. Neal, said about physicians in this area. 
not only do we have private physicians, but we also have hospital-based group contracts, mm -hmm. and some of them are backed by private equity, and it makes a little bit of an imbalance between a not-for-profit not hospital versus a for-profit private equity firm. And you'll see that in many of the different um, hospital-based groups. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've got uh, Chairman Katz followed by Councilmember Lutke and then Councilmember Sales and I assume. Yep. Councilmember May. Chair Katz. Thank you all. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, I don't have this slide up in front of me, but I'd be happy to circle back with you and get you that information. Of course. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I, always is a long time, so I'm not sure. Um, So I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. So um, the contracted groups that, that uh, Dr. Damiano spoke to, for instance, often the physicians will be a contracted group. The hospital runs the emergency department. So in other words, the hospital's nursing leadership and all of the other leadership and staffing is done by the hospital, but the physician group, instead of being a private practice family medicine doctor here or another type of doctor here who are coming in to help out. They usually provide board certified emergency medicine trained physicians to be the physician portion of the staffing. And so that's usually the way it's gone. Now in, in over 20 years ago, the hospital still often ran uh, the emergency department, but the physician model may have been a little different. And that, that varies from hospitals to hospital, but that generally is the truth for most, most hospitals. Sure, Germantown Emergency Center still still exists and still runs and still sees patients. There's data in your packet regarding how its throughput is um, compared to other emergency departments as well. Um, the contracted group, U.S. Acute Care Solutions, contracts for just the emergency department physician and physician extender or physician um, assistant who sees patient. The nursing staff, the building, the, the uh, janitorial staffing, all of that is still Adventist Healthcare's employees and is run and organized operationally by Adventist Healthcare in partnership with the physician group. Can you have a separate facility? So it's, it's, it's based on the model and the type of place. Germantown Emergency Center has a tendency to be, to be faster. It's a smaller, sleeker unit of care. Yeah, it's a smaller, sleeker unit of care with not a lot of distractors needing its resources, right? It's there for the emergency department, so it's a little faster. It's a little different than Shady Grove's emergency department, different than White Oak's emergency department, different from one of our other hospitals down in Prince George's County, but Washington's emergency department as well. They're all different. Yes. Right. It is insurance driven. Um, it's insurance driven. So the insurance will reimburse physicians or compensate them for their care at a lower rate because they can, and so they do. Um, and, and that's just that's just the truth of it. And it's not just Montgomery County; it's the state of Maryland. But if you think about physicians with their debt, which is on average now $250,000 when they get out of school, on average, some higher, <laughs> um, than coming to Montgomery County, which is one of the most expensive places to live in the United States, those two things combined, if someone's making a decision on specialty or where to live, they're going to choose some place that they can actually pay that debt down more efficiently, often. And so that makes it more difficult for them to choose to stay here. Often when we are employing physicians or having physicians engage with us, most of the time they're coming back because they have family that's here, not because they're wanting to just kind of, you know, be in our area. And one, I think it was one of your slides, um, it had that Missouri had more beds than a better compensation. Well, in Missouri, first the bed, I'll tackle that first. 
here, the reimbursement model that we have in, in Maryland is different than literally any other state. There is no other state that limits the way that hospitals get reimbursed or the number of beds that they can have per area, per, per, per population. And so we're different than Missouri in that regard because there's an external body who's mandating that this hospital must have this number of beds and no more or that there may or may not be a new hospital that's, that's built in a certain area. Okay, so it's restricted in that way. Um, you know, as far as compensation is concerned, the, the insurance companies understand and there is just a difference in approach to how physicians are comp um, compensated. It's not something that I know enough about the way they operate to see how they do that, but they do, and that is the bottom line of how it lands on physician compensation. Yeah. Um, whether or not you can have a hospital goes through the state of Maryland. Yes. And it's based on the number of beds you so. Yes. And you're, are you saying, I don't want to put words in but are you saying that the Missouri's of the world, the other places, actually have a different uh, business model? Yes. Of what can be built? Yes. And what should be built? I'm not gonna say should, but 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 um, because there's there's different di different <laughs> give you a secret hand signal. Um, there are just different approaches to how people believe other uh, that the population should be cared for. And here, the idea is to restrict the number of inpatient beds, increase the population health in ways that keep people out of the hospital. That's not the same model that is in Missouri. Therefore, they have more beds that they have free reign to 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 have in place. Um, and they may have, on different times of the year, emptier beds than we do. That, that's something that's allowed there that really we don't have in place here. Two other questions. Um, someone stays in the hospital, they, they don't have insurance, what happens? They can't, they they, can't move them to someplace else because they have no place else to go, what happens? Sometimes they stay for longer than their insured, uh, 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 you know, e equivalents in the hospital, they always get cared for. It's not really a choice that, that we would, would ever try, try to make or allow to really uh, make either. Um, and then eventually they get placed when we figure out a way with our care navigation and social work how to get them through the complex system to get them someplace that they're going to be self, safe and well cared for. They eventually do get through the system, it's just sometimes more difficult. Does the state of Maryland have any system where they would no. And you said make it easier for to open the office. Are there doctors that want to come here that we could make it easier for them to open that office? I believe so. I believe so. I mean, it's hard to really reach into the, the hearts and minds of a lot of physicians, but there are, are many good reasons to live in our area. Living in the capital, it's a cosmopolitan area. There's, I'm just, <laughs> but there are very many good reasons to live here, and so with just a little bit of encouragement. Best schools, uh, one of the best school systems in the nation as well, right here in the backyard. There are plenty of reasons for people to want to, to live here, but when you have a burden of debt, you have a burden of, of a lot of different things, you have to make wise choices for an amount of time until you then you get to the point of coming back and afford sometimes to live here. So I, I believe that if we incentivize uh, physician practices, they would come more and more. Thank you to all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Lutke. Thank you. Actually, the story you're talking about where someone you know ends up in the ED and then they have follow-up appointment with the specialist who they were sent to you know who cared for them in the hospital but the specialist is out of network the hospital was in network you got taken there by ambulance you didn't choose where you went but yet you're the patient then trying to navigate that on their own and um, that happened to me after a, a long stay at Sibley uh, many many years ago and mercifully the the specialist who um, who had me for follow-up, who had treated me while I was there, just wrote off the bill and said, you didn't have a choice in this matter, and I was a law student at the time, and he felt bad, you know. But there are people who have to struggle with that every day. Um, I know you touched upon the fact that there are federal laws that govern hospital care, but they don't govern urgent care. So EMTALA only applies to in acute hospital care, but does not apply to urgent care. Is that right? Okay, is that one of the reasons why there's some hesitancy in the back and forth over um, 
whether it's patient driven or whether it's when you're on a telehealth with the hospital over making that judgment call about sending the person to urgent care? There's a number of reasons that we saw limited use with the urgent care program. Uh, it's still in place, by the way. It's been mm -hmm. partnered with Kaiser. They have a 24 hour advanced urgent care in Germantown, and we encourage EMS from across the county to use that. The limitation, obviously, is that the patient is a Kaiser subscriber. And right. we have also partnered with MedStar Urgent Cares. They are limited hours. Um, right. They, you know, I think we have agreed to transport patients there until 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but very limited capabilities. Um, there's some days where they will be open to us, but then you call on the phone and you describe what you have. Uh, and they say, well, we don't have a radiology tech today to do an right. x-ray. And so right. you can't come here. So we, we're diverted away. And it doesn't take a, but a couple of those experiences among EMS for them to be turned off to the program and not recommend it. So. Right. Um, and I know you did touch upon the fact that there are you know, obviously, particularly in the behavioral, behavioral health arena in the emergency departments, where even if they're then subsequently admitted, um, there are situations here where patients have been involuntarily committed, but they're sitting in the hospital for 100 days or more because there isn't anywhere to place them that's non-acute hospital setting but is sufficient for their involuntary commitment needs. And I, I know that's even... Um, a bigger issue with respect to our adolescent population who have coexisting psychiatric and IDD needs. We have, I think, 12 beds in the entire state of Maryland for that population, all based at Shepherd Pratt. Um, and that continues to, to cause issues, but especially with respect to that, because somebody with high acute psychiatric needs can also have an acute medical need at the same time, and they need to be in the acute care facility. Um, the issue of constant observers and the necessity for them. This might just be anecdotal, and this is coming from my prior work, um, and, and I got to work with MIMS a little bit while I was at the state, but it, it seems like there's been a higher need for constant observers in more recent memory. Um, um, is that your experience as well? You know, I don't know how the data right now to, to answer that in a concrete way. I do know that the mental health needs of the communities that I serve and that my health care system, and I'll let Dr. Daviano speak to this as well, uh, have noticed that there are, are plenty of mental health patients and their acuity uh, is, is very, very, very high. And as the acuity goes up, that means that their observation needs and their resource needs in every way go, go up. And so there will be an increased need for having that one-to-one -one kind of care, which is also very difficult to staff for in a business model because those folks yeah. are in the emergency department every day. Uh, it's not a, a known entity that comes and goes in, in, in waves. Well, and that's another, you know, another concern, which is whether they're in the emergency department or they've been admitted to a floor, in order to address the increased constant observer status needs, it requires pulling a nurse out of rotation or pulling a tech out of rotation, which then, you know, as we've, as we've talked, like there's not just one thing that's impacting this whole system. There are multiple things that are impacting, but that's alleviating or um, taking them out of the queue, if you will, for addressing other patients who are there um, also on those floors. And I just wanted to know if you had any comments about, you know, if you could, if you could deliver a wish list for how to make that better, what would that entail for the hospitals? I'm going to let you answer but, that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a very complicated problem. Obviously, you want to make sure that you provide the safest environment that you can for the patient. And there are some of these patients, when they're admitted, who have uh, behavioral health uh, issues that uh, are accompanied by um, uh, violence. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure not only that you have an observer there, and you're right, it takes that one-on-one -on -one attention to watch that patient uh, during their stay. Um, but when the patient becomes increasingly difficult to handle, then you have to move them to the intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. We do not have an inpatient behavioral health unit at either uh, in Silver Spring. We do have one in Germantown, but mm -hmm. it's all for volunteer uh, patients. Sometimes if the behavior is accompanied by violent, extreme violent behavior or it's accompanied by substance abuse, uh, protective services also has to be involved there as well too. And it really adds to uh, the anxiety of the staff on that particular unit. And where I last left off in November, last November, so we're coming up on a year, uh, there had been um, an effort at the state 
through the Behavioral Health Administration to develop. A, there's a system that MIMS has now where it tells you who's, who's got what beds, what status they're on, what color code they're on, and if you need to divert, et cetera. There was supposed to be a similar system for behavioral health beds and availability, and that was requested in 2014, and to my knowledge still has not happened. Is that based on what you understand as well? It still does not exist. They haven't made any further steps towards getting that available for the state. I'm not aware of the behavioral health side of things, but there is an effort to replace the EMS notification, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just with a, a more objective look called EDIS, but it's still under development. And that's, um, that's done regionally, right? So hospitals are as grouped and clustered by regions within that EMS notification system. So MEMS is broken down by region, regions one through five, but there's no border to prevent somebody from region three crossing. Oh, yeah, 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 for transport purposes. I know you go to Virginia, you go to DC, you go where you need to go to get the patient the, the best care possible. But in terms of like how they're clustered for notification, they, there's different regions that are assigned together. Yeah, they're, they're, if you go to a region five page, you'll see the hospitals that are in region five. That's where we are. And our issue, especially that we have here, is we have a high concentration of population, um, you know, in certain parts of the county and in other parts of the county, we have lower population, but also further away from hospitals and further away from definitive care, um, which means those patients end up getting transported if, if we're busy inside the county out to Frederick or over to Howard County um, if needed. From EMS, you're saying? Yeah. We do very well here in the county, and we're well resourced in terms of the number of hospitals, and we don't take a large number of patients out of the county. Okay. We do run mutual aid into Frederick County, and we would end up transporting to mm -hmm. Frederick uh, in those cases, but it's a very low number. Okay. And Dr. Stoddard, you look like you're about to say something. <clears throat> yeah, I thought I'd seen it too, and, and you can look on the BHA website. They did launch a dashboard that has the bed availability for adult geriatric, adolescent, uh, psychiatric beds across the state. So they do have it now. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sales, followed by Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Okay. Making sure my mic works. So thank you for um, convening this meeting, and thank you for the reports that we heard. Um, I'll go by the uh, speakers with the questions that I had. Um, uh, Mr. Stoddard, you mentioned that um, the EMS capacity officer is currently actively um, assessing the different um, emergency departments throughout the county. That was, that was uh, Chief Kaufman. I'll let him respond. Sorry, Chief. <laughs> okay. So that, that position, um, I know that there is going to be an annual report. Um, we'll I guess the findings be included, or how are those reports uh, evaluated? Yeah. So we keep an eye on a number of factors. The, the uh, most important thing we're watching is unit of uh, unit availability and also our times okay. for the turnover time and drop time. And we're doing quite well since that position has been added. Yes. Okay. So are are we? Is that information shared during the public safety committee meetings? Uh, I had a couple of slides that did display our turnover time or drop time specifically. I can go back to that if you'd like to see it again. Okay. Well, I, I just had questions about the transition process from EMS to the emergency department and just wanted to see if that's being assessed. The time the time it takes, yes. Mm -hmm. We do measure that okay. and that, that's called turnover time and we're actively, we watch that every day. Yeah. Okay, because I did see a few of the slides that spoke to the turnover time. Can you walk me through the process for when a patient um, is dropped off at the emergency room and then the ambulance arrives, the patient is stable? What is that process time of transferring them into the emergency room to? It's really patient specific. It depends on uh, whether they are ambulatory, can they walk uh, mm -hmm. in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we are moving patients out to the waiting room if they've been assessed by us. We collaborate with the charge nurse in that case and make a decision about whether the patient is going to a bed right away, and that may depend on what else is happening in the emergency department at the time of the other patients. But if the emergency department's busy and there's no beds and the patient is stable, they might end up in the waiting room. If the patient's on a stretcher, 
we have to wait for a stretcher to become available. Uh, if there's one available, obviously we're going right away. If we have to wait, we're waiting for a period of time until something does become available. A lot of times our, our emergency departments are finding extra space or they'll make a bed in the hallway for us in order to turn, turn care over. But we define turnover as the patients physically move to a hospital resource, whether it's a chair or a bed. And then we've conducted a warm handoff between the EMS clinician and the nurse or the doctor. And when those two things are done, we mark that the turnover has been complete. Okay. I'm just thinking of the longer ER wait times, the longer depend uh, transfer times will impact the response times for EMS because they are in the emergency room. And so I'm just wanting to get some clarity on how long our EMS you know, staff are spending in the ER yeah, to wait for staff to admit and transfer patients so you can get your supplies back to get to your next call. We spend a lot of time and effort and resources on making sure that we keep our EMS units available to respond to calls. Okay. It is not impacting response times right now. Okay. We're very well resourced, yes. Okay. You were going to say something, Chief? No, I was going to add, um, Chief Kaufman and his team have done, uh, you know, an amazing job with the uh, transport alerts that we get during the day. So we know at any given time how many of our units are committed to calls. Mm. When we hit the number 25, we all get those alerts. So the EMS officers, the battalion chiefs, the duty operations chiefs um, will take action in the field to increase our availability. We will recall ambulances from training details. We will send the EMS duty officers to the affected hospitals so they can get some one-on-one -on -one interaction with the staff to try to free up some units. We even reach out to our um, volunteers, the LFRDs, and they will get resources immediately available and put extra ambulances in service. So we do this every day. We monitor, we get the alerts, we take action, and we increase our availability to meet the, um, the momentary demands of the system. So, good. All right. Next question I had with um, regards to our hospital system. Um, our team met with uh, Nexus Montgomery last month and um, we were told about the program's evaluations and how often those are done. Um, I thought it was an annual basis. It's actually a year and a half that these programs are evaluated. Um, just understanding um, how we are implementing the program. How are you implementing, I guess, the recommendations that you're finding once you evaluate um, some of the programs? Sure. For, so, for example, for the General Assembly Hospital Throughput Work Group, um, the, the work group members have discussed that for each recommendation that they provide, there needs to be action-oriented implementation steps and which stakeholders are going to be responsible for implementing those recommendations. Um, historically, there had been some state produced and other legislative reports that had some good ideas but not direct action steps. So we know the work group's focused on that, and then that report will be submitted to the General Assembly uh, for their consideration to be implemented into policy. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, I know that... Uh, some of the priorities that have uh, come forth and have been recommended um, have been mandated by state law um, and hospitals can focus on those priorities. Um, but just wondering if um, where does addressing, I guess, emergency department wait times fall under the list of priorities for hospitals in our county? I don't know who wants to speak to that. It's a significant priority for the hospitals, uh, as evidenced by the General Assembly Hospital Throughput Work Group, as well as the EDI initiative in consultation and partnership with the Health Services Cost Review Commission, as well as the MHA-led Performance Improvement Initiative. So there's three different initiatives that we're focused on, but um, I'd be happy to turn it over to any of our hospital partners if they have anything they'd like to add to that as well. Of course, so at Holy Cross, we focus on it daily. And just to piggyback on what Jake was talking about on the Eddie project, it breaks down into three areas. The first area is the uh, EMS turnaround time that uh, Chief Kaufman and others have already talked to. 
And what we do there is we monitor that daily. Uh, we have an electronic health record that tracks those times. And in addition to those uh, daily uh, tracking, we also get uh, reports from uh, EMS, uh, Montgomery County, as well as MIMS. Uh, Tim Chismar sends us our weekly report so we can see what our ED turnaround times are for ambulances, both median and the 90th percentile. The other two things that we look at uh, very uh, closely with regard to the Eddy project, the amount of time from arrival to discharge or those patients who are not admitted to the hospital that we want to see, treat, evaluate, uh, and then release from the hospital. And we track those times daily as well, too. And then the third group are arrival to admission, and we have milestones uh, from the time the patient crosses the door to the time they're triaged to the time they're placed in a room until the time a disposition is made till the time that they're admitted to the hospital, and we track those. The emergency department is the front door to the hospital, and that's wrapped up into uh, the daily work that we do with huddles, uh, looking at throughput and managing our beds and capacity. Thank you. Very much an image, a mirror image at Adventist Healthcare as well. We have two hospitals that are particularly overcrowded in the emergency department, Port Washington as well as White Oak, and they are twice a day doing in addition to the once a day plus the other metrics that are being looked at. And so a lot of this was going on before the Eddie Project and other things came along, and so it's just standard business to look at that throughput. Thank you for that. Now, are you tracking any individuals that have come to the weight room but have left the weight room without being, without receiving any care? Yes, I mean, what you're referring to is left without being seen. Okay. Uh, there are Thank several you. different categories of patients that come in uh, to the waiting room and they're triaged and they leave, or they just come into the waiting room and then they leave. I, I think the goal of all emergency departments is that they're triaged within 10 minutes, and we pay very close attention to that. And then we also track our left without being seen uh, percentage and uh, work with our physician partners in order to decrease that and mitigate it. So do you have a number on those percentages? I think it really varies. We try and keep those numbers down below 5%. Okay. Now is that standard across all hospitals? Okay. It is. All right. And I know that, um, you know, uh, recruitment and retention across the hospitals, across our public safety force is down. And um, just wanted to know, um, I know that you mentioned a few of the programs but are you doing any collaborations with MCPS, Montgomery College, U USG? Yes, is the, the, short, the short answer. I know that everyone is um, looking at every available resource that is available, Montgomery College being just, just one of them. I think there's a whole swath of opportunities that we look at. I mentioned the international nurses, the nurse residency program. Montgomery College is one of several that are looked at and uh, that, that we try to collaborate with to get our nursing resource well resourced in a pipeline that's coming uh, uh, to us. I think that's often the case across the entirety of, of healthcare right now. Okay. Now, are there any resources that the hospital is investing in those recruitment and retention? Are there bonuses? You know, the county is doing a bonus with paramedics and EMS, so. Any hiring bonuses, student loan repayments that are happening? So there are a variety of different programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we do some training within the hospital in some of those hard to fill positions. We have a partnership with Maryland Physicians Care uh, where uh, we work with them in order to develop a career ladder for some of our entry level uh, colleagues to uh, develop and, and move on into different careers and partner with them on their education. We have uh, multiple education affiliation agreements, a unique uh, relationship with Montgomery County uh, Community College in Germantown because we're directly on that campus there. We have numerous uh, incentives for recruitment and retention, uh, looking at training, uh, doing market analysis. And we're in a tough market, as I think uh, everybody here would would uh, uh, admit to and in terms of attracting talent, retaining that talent, and you know trying to get um, 
replenish those individuals that, that we've lost. Also, we have started a CNA academy or school and a pharmacy tech school because the resource was so not, not available in the marketplace, mm -hmm. trying to increase that resource to help give aid to our nursing staff who's so valuable to keep them in place as well. And so all the things you mentioned, we, we're all looking and trying to be creative about how we both attract, retain, uh, you know, and, and increase our, our workforce in areas that are, that are high target. Okay. It's very important that we are also apprised of those efforts and the resources that can help support those efforts because we want to be partners in ensuring the recruitment and retention of this workforce, this very important workforce. I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Um, all right, a few things. Thank you all for being here today and for all the, all the info. Um, okay, so looking at some of the causal impacts, um, the increase in demand that, uh, that I think you mentioned, Mr. Kaufman, um, is there anything that, uh, that you can share with us around why we're seeing that or what we could? Chief Kinsley's been doing this way longer than I have. Uh, we've been watching a, uh, an increase, a uh, steady increase over the years that saw a dip right during COVID through 2020 where people uh, did not call 911 as frequently. And I think we're just seeing an extension of that continued slow rise and by we're speculating more calls than ever this year. I can't point to any particular reason why that has steadily increased. But No, and I'll just add that uh, if you look at the data, Right, that last point on the graph really doesn't tell us much. I think we need to look at two or three more years to see if we're continuing to rise. Um, you know, it could be the fact that our population is increasing. It could be the fact that our population is aging. Many factors that have to deal with that. Um, but it is a, a, a very good curiosity for us that our call volume dipped during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it looks like now it's risen not just to where baseline, but it, we're above, it's above that. now. Yeah I, yeah, I think we'll certainly want to return to that um, when we have more data, noting also that, you know, even as, um, you know, for COVID, we're seeing that the immediate impacts, especially for folks who are vaccinated, are much less severe than what we saw pre-vaccination, that we're also learning more about the respiratory, cardiac, neurological impacts that having had COVID uh, can, you know, can be a contributor there. And so I think that's just something for us to think about in terms of we want to be preventing this rise, you know, now and in the future, doing everything that we can around, you know, vaccination rollouts and all that kind of thing. There's been a dip, obviously, that we've seen in that. And um, focusing on, on that, even though there's a decreased sense of urgency among the population, I think, uh, because of uh, you know, the less severe reactions that we're seeing now, but we're also want to, gonna wanna prevent that contributing or worsening to this, this problem. Um, so given the you know, increased uh, ED boarding and ambulance diversion that have emerged as kind of unanticipated consequences uh, of Maryland's model of hospital financing uh, not only that but in in part do that um, i expect that we'll see the recommendations that are going to be coming before the general assembly um, I, i'm going to expect that we're going to see some recommendations around that does that seem like an accurate prediction anyone who wants to speak to that i don't want to speak directly for the work group but i can say that's one of the subjects being considered by the work group dr Sutter, did you want to say something I mean, I think it's it's certainly a big piece of this. I think we, you know, the total cost of care model has been very good at keeping patient costs pretty well confined, but I don't think it necessarily well adapts to the huge changes in in in, in service delivery demand that we've saw. Obviously, the pandemic was unprecedented in many ways, but and so it, you know, one of the things that we heard very clearly from the hospitals when they were coming to us for additional support is, you know, obviously when the total cost of care model does not conceive of COVID, they run over their current costs, and then you end up with things like not being able to invest in their CIP, pro CIP programs for uh, replacement of technology and replacement of, of large infrastructure pieces, and that has a long-term cascading effect. And so I don't think that, obviously, the, the total cost, cost of care model could not have foreseen the pandemic, but I think it's given light to the fact that there needs to be some uh, potential greater flexibility in, in this process to reflect significant shifts in the, whether it's workforce, uh, mm -hmm. care needs, whatever it is. And so I would hope 
that this would be a serious, a serious conversation in the state level, whether it comes from this work group or mm -hmm. comes to the legislature itself. Yeah, just flagging for us, because even though it's a state conversation, obviously it has huge impacts here at the county level, so that's something that we're going to want to keep our eye on and see how, you know, the, how we want to weigh in on that as well. And so we'll want to continue having communication, I'm sure, with all of you about that. Um, the um, Oh, I also thought it was really uh, interesting, um, Dr. McNeil, Dr. McNeil right, um, that, we, that you noted that people who move back here, we lose a lot of people uh, to other places geographically, but people who move back, it's often because of their family ties, and that really uh, highlights the importance of us continuing to grow and strengthen our pipeline programs here. That's just, a, that's just gonna be a huge advantage for us. Um, the lack of specialist availability, um, delaying some of the uh, ED evaluations and dispositions, um, as well as our, uh, you know, we don't have enough, you know, primary care folks, private practice, et cetera. You, you mentioned about the potential um, need for more incentives there. Um, just noting also that for our folks who are uninsured and underinsured, or folks who are part of the Montgomery CARES system, uh, our low-income folks, that I'm sure we, this must be a more, even more pronounced issue for them in terms of access to those folks, to those primary care folks and to those specialists. It's something that I've heard from um, residents who are on the Montgomery CARES program, uh, difficulties in getting access, timely access to specialists um, who are part of that system. So that's also something for us to look into. But I wonder um, if you have, um, data, whether quantitative or observational uh, on hand, on the insurance, um, you know, what folks have when they come before you, uh, uninsured, underinsured, folks who are on the Montgomery CARES system would be really interesting for us to dig into. Uh, does anybody have any data or observations on that front? The data exists mm -hmm. so with us. I, I don't have right. that, you know, we'll speak to that. But there, I will say in Montgomery County in particular, there are those patients are underinsured, not as many uninsured, but their, avail their ability to access uh, specialty care, whether that be pediatric specialty care, mm -hmm. whether that be um, neurosurgical care, those things are very, very difficult for them to access in any kind of a, of a real time for, for adequate care. I would say that, but data I have with me right now. It'd be, it'd be great to get some follow-up data on that. If you're seeing folks here in Montgomery County who are coming in uninsured and we, we missed them because we should have them enrolled in Montgomery CARES, or if you're having a lot of people who are on the Montgomery CARES program and they're coming before you and this is someone who had they been, oh, we have somebody here who can speak to that? Yeah. Is that great? Yeah, that'd be great. Can you come up to the mic? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Anise Cody. I'm the president of Holy Cross Health Network, which uh, operates our three health centers that care for people who are uninsured. So we work closely with Montgomery Cares. Um, Montgomery Cares does have a, a program called Project Access that provides specialty care for people who are uninsured. It is volunteer or um, the providers in it, the specialists in it are either volunteering or taking off, agreeing to take a lower um, payment in order to see these patients, but the wait times for these, you know, there's, there's certainly more demand than there is supply on that. Um, can I ask you, uh, they agreed to take a lower payment. Um, do you know, do you happen to know offhand how recently the, how much of that payment they get? Has that been adjusted with inflation over the years? I think it's individually negotiated. And so it, it's not a specific rate that is given to everybody. It is really um, determined based on what they are willing to take. Thank you. Just so noting, I guess, for, you know, for our side of things, as we look at how we can make Montgomery Cares more effective and try to make sure that those folks who, if we can get them enrolled in the Montgomery Cares system, we want to make sure that they're accessing those services and hopefully, you know, not heading uh, to, the, to the ED, that that's something that we also may, may want to take a good look at. Um, I have heard from some Montgomery Cares providers that that uh, percentage has not been uh, adequately uh, matched up to inflation over the years. And so when we look at how many people are volunteering to be part of that, uh, you know, the numbers are not potentially where they, where they could be, and that might be worth looking at an adjustment. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Um, Dr. McNeil, you also noted that, um, as, as, and has been alluded to by a number of people, that some types of patients are harder to place. Um, due to lack of particular resources, or um, could you be specific and, and give us a few of those? I know they've kind of been mentioned here and there, but if you could break it down for us, that'd be great. So there are patients who will be in the hospital who may need home health for wound care or for IV antibiotics 
for uh, a whole host of other diagnoses that really can't wait for X once they leave the hospital. And so um, Advanced Healthcare has their own home health, but that they are very, very busy. And so if we see a patient who on day on Monday needs to be discharged but has to have home health care within two days and we can't find it within our system, we go outside of our system looking for home health that may be able to serve them adequately. And often we, we can't find the ability to get those folks taken care of safely at home within that two to three day, day span. And so they're going to stay in the hospital until we can guarantee that because it's the right thing to do, number one. But number two, we don't want them to come back to the emergency department or back to the hospital for something that we have some control over. And so there's that kind of dance and balance to do that. In addition, there may be patients who have to go to an outpatient rehab for after a hip fracture or after many diagnoses that may be there. They absolutely cannot go home, even with home health care. That requires them to go to um, a rehab or a SNF of some sort. And then that requires us to wait, because if there are no beds there, there are no beds there. I think there's an increase of about 30 percent during fiscal year 21 and 22 of those patients having to wait in the hospital longer than was before the pandemic. You're talking about rehab? Rehab, the outpatient realm of, of uh, SNFs, all of that. And so it's really very impactful in our inpatient uh, setting and the people who are staying there for longer, up to five days sometimes longer. Thank you. At one point, I remember we actually had a, an adolescent mental health patient who was boarding in an ED for 17 plus weeks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and so mm -hmm. that gives you an extreme example of some of these placements being incredibly difficult, uh, particularly, and I think uh, uh, colleagues from Holy Cross uh, talked about, you know, if they have a history of uh, violence or, you know, those are the patients who need the help the most who are not, you know, you know our, our EDs are doing a good job of keeping them safe and comfortable, but they're they're not applying the level of treatment that they would get in some of these specialty care facilities. Right. And so not only are they um, not getting the care, but they're tying up a bed. So it's really, you know, there's some of these we have to work out that, you know, yes, it would improve ED boarding and ED wait times, but it also, frankly, more importantly, would be a better outcome for the patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that leads me to my next question about the diversion center, Dr. Soto, that you mentioned, um, which, which is going to help. Um, but can, can transfer happen from the hospitals to the diversion center? Yeah, that's the way it was designed. So the diversion center will operate really off of a model of diversion either from arrest and incarceration, but also in, you know, diverting from the EDs where someone who's taken for you know, a, a short-term uh, mental health evaluation could be transferred there, get more. So we don't have to have like a first responder go between also between the hospitals and the diversion center. There's a direct. Yeah, so we've talked about direct, well, we've got to work through tr the details of direct transport. We obviously have to do that. But uh, once they've been evaluated in ED, rather than have them ED board, we can also transfer them to the to the diversion center as well, where they, we can begin the process of figuring out where they're going to go afterwards. Now, obviously, we're going to face the same challenge the hospitals face right now, which is where are they going after their, mm -hmm. you know, their, their 72 hour period. Um, but obviously, you know, the diversion center is being built, so we've you know, got a few years to figure that out. But it, that's going to be a pro problem the county's going to have to take on, too. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And noting also, you mentioned uh, that we'll probably be seeing a proposal on a walk in uh, facility. Yeah, no, it's something the county executive is incredibly interested in doing. I know that Health and Human Services are actually, you know, there's actually a partnership between services and prevent homelessness as well as uh, the um, Behavioral Health, uh, Dr. Santiago and, and Behavioral Health and Crisis Services to try and put together a proposal that uh, looks and feels very similar to the Diversion Center but allows for uh, the walk-in capability that we, you know, originally talked about that is an important alternative. Great. And so that is, yeah, that is coming. That's going to be key, obviously, because that's how we hopefully avoid, you know, we save the responders time of taking them to the hospital, we save the hospital bed, all, like all of those pieces if we can get in there at a, at a preventative level. Same as, you know, similar to making sure that everyone is, is making use of PCPs and specialists beforehand as much as possible. Prevention is going to be really helpful here. Um, so yeah, look forward to seeing that proposal and appreciate you all um, working on that. Um, Last question, um, you know, I noticed that um, I represent District 5, which includes White Oak, and they have the worst ED uh, arrival to discharge times by like a good measure. Uh, and uh, so I'm wondering if there's anyone who can speak to causes and solutions there. Are we looking at different types and complexity of cases? Are we looking at folks who have uh, less access to or less making less use of, uh, you know, PCPs and specialists or, you know, any thoughts on this would be appreciated. 
So um, when Washington Adventist Hospital switched and transferred over to White Oak Medical Center, within less than a week they were at capacity and beyond. And so they, are, they live in a space that there are always more borders in that emergency department and more inpatients really in that hospital than they actually have physical staffed beds because of the fact that the capacity there for the population and community that is there is, is not right size. So there are multitudes of things that they're doing, the things that we have mentioned that are pretty much standard in every hospital they're doing, and they're doing, like I said, a, a, a huddle twice a day to see what they can do to get folks through the emergency department. They have a pilot that looks like it's going to go into permanency, where if a patient, depending on the category, is uh, admitted, they, even if they don't have an inpatient bed assigned, they come up to that unit, which encourages folks to turn over the beds a little bit more quickly to get those patients safe to out to uh, help decompress that emergency department more. They have um, in, in process an ability to be able to, in an organized fashion, identify patients in that waiting room who may need more resources than are able to be seen in the emergency department and gone, gone to home, but less resources than need a full inpatient, a full um, emergency department bed. And so kind of a, a mid-care uh, area where they can be turned over, gotten labs, and done that more efficiently. And so they have a multitude of ways to address the problem, but it's a capacity issue there. Their patient population is a, a great mix of folks who have resources as far as um, PCPs and those who do not as well. Um, and there's always there's language barriers more there than they have in the rest of our hospitals and Adventist healthcare as well. And so that whole mix is causing and driving kind of a perfect storm of issues that cause it to be higher. But they are doing a multitude of actually innovative things trying to get that wait time down. Thank you. And we have um, comments. Can we? Yeah. OK, yeah. great. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. So your question and her answer, I think. You could introduce yourself first. Barton Leonard. Barton you could introduce yourself Urban first. Hospital, Barton Leonard. Uh, I'm the medical director at Suburban and represent Hopkins. So your question and her answer was or just very gets to the heart of the state level question, right? Mm -hmm. So you asked, okay, why uh, does she have the, or that, not she, but that facility have the longest ED wait times, right? And her answer was they built it and they were immediately at capacity, at occupancy and full, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go back to Chief Kaufman's slide, do you have that slide? Uh, then where you have the occupancy rate and the ED wait times. I, I love data. This slide is unbelievably revealing about the nature of the problem. So on the y-axis, it has uh, occupancy. Yeah. When you look at that little dot for the state of Maryland, it's not even close to the rest of the cluster yeah. of the rest of the states, there. right? Okay. It is so far out, you can you're pretty much going to miss it when you look at the graph because it's like three standard deviations off, right? So everybody else is over here in terms of occupancy. In other words, we don't have enough hospital beds mm -hmm. in this state. Yeah. Something about this system does not incentivize us to have enough inpatient capacity. That's the main driver. So I loved your last slide that said capacity, capacity, capacity. Yeah. Right, that is the number one issue. Everything else, as you can tell, like from your answer, mm -hmm. we're, we're using best, every single hospital is using Standard. all these best practices that we put in place, and we're trying to partner with our EMS colleagues, post acute care colleagues, et cetera. And I think we're doing a fantastic job, given that dot. I think we're doing a really good job, but we're never going to be able to fix the problem when we're, you know, three standard deviations out, and we just don't have enough hospital beds. We have too many patients that need to be in those beds, and therefore, like to that left without being seen question, some patients just give up and leave the emergency department, right? So that's, I think, the state level biggest driver mm -hmm. of ED wait times. And we're being stymied by the state level algorithms. Well, so the state laudably wanted more people to get primary care and not use the EDs as right. there, but yeah. if you didn't build the capacity in the primary care system and you just took away the ED capacity without solving the first problem, then this is 
an expected result mm -hmm. that you would get. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you look at the, you know, it's not surprising to me that Holy Cross and White Oak are right near the bottom. Their catchment areas include significant portions of the district, Prince George's County, places that we know have primary care access problems. And so, of course, they would fill up the quickest because they're, they're serving populations that have tremendous need. And, you know, we saw historic inequities in, in particularly black and brown residents during COVID in terms of comorbidities and results from that. And so it's not surprising that if you, you know, you look at some of the, the, the Worst outcomes we have from COVID, COVID they track the census uh, tracks in, in along those, that border area that White Oak and, and Holy Cross largely serve. And so it's all part of the same conversation that we've been having around health and equity and the, and the challenges that it presents, but it obviously is playing out acutely here because we've, we've, we've and I, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with the state decision to want people to have primary care, we should want that. But taking away the hospital capacity before building the primary care capacity has left us in a very difficult position. Awesome. We can do many things. We, we've done those many things even before the Eddie Project was, was launched. And we can continue to crack away 3%, 5%. But to Bart's statement there, 3% or 5% is not going to get us near anywhere, any other hospital mm -hmm. or any other state that we're we're dealing with. We really are going to have a hard time doing that. Appreciate that. So it's, it's good that this conversation is happening at the state level and that we have, there's several balls in play that are going to uh, further the conversation um, and it's going to be really critical for us to win. So I appreciate you all. Neil, thanks. Uh, Chair Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be quick, but so candidly, why wouldn't the state allow more beds? Can't, when I thought, what I had always heard was the hospitals didn't want any more hospitals so that their return on investment would be higher. That's what I had always heard. That that's why you limit the beds. I will say that that actually doesn't doesn't uh Well I understand it now, but yeah. <laughs> so, um yeah, it's not a just by plain business models, when there is a demand, you want to, to meet that demand. And so hospitals would never cut off their own ability to make revenue by limiting their ability to serve patients. Uh, and so that's, that's definitely not a hospital want or, or driver. That's definitely something that's built into the model. Once again, trying to make sure that patients get care on the outside of the hospital, which once again is noble. It's just that hospitals and the healthcare systems don't control any of that. And so we, it, it's not, it's a, a mismatch that's, that's fairly large actually, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and the other 49 states on that graph we're in Maine at that point <laughs> on that listing. You know, like the there. There's a different reimbursement system for those 49 states. Yep. And their reimbursement is directly related that fiscal year to how many patients they see. So there is incentive to build more hospital or more capacity or more staffed beds, et cetera. And we just have a different uh, system um, in, in Maryland. And I think to uh, Chief Kaufman's point where uh, that line that came down and then the uh, points diverged, uh, that, that's when uh, I guess the GBR uh, went into effect. Um, so there's something about the system that creates this. And, and to the, the working group, et cetera, the, is the goal to change the system? Because if it's not, it should be. Uh, Mr. Chair, what I can say is the work groups are considering the impact of the total cost of care model on this issue. Um, but that being said, the work group is still developing their recommendations, and I'd be happy to share them with you once they're developed. We, we would like to see them, please, and we would like to be your partner into changing this system. Absolutely. And to your question earlier, Mr. Chair, it's yes. the average U.S. wait times. I didn't know if you saw that. So. Yeah, I did. I saw it afterwards. Great. Close. Thanks. Man, this has been sobering. Um, just, uh, you know, we, we, we received the presentation last year, which was incredibly helpful, but I think we've narrowed in even more specifically than then on what the core root of the challenges are. Um, and this body is not without influence. Um, and so although these most many of these decisions are made at the state level, I think it seems pretty clear that we'll want another briefing after the work group's work is completed to see what recommendations they make. I'd also be curious as to which of our colleagues in the Montgomery County delegation are working on this issue and seeing what we can do to support their efforts. We obviously have a new governor as well, um, and I'd be curious as to their position on this matter um, moving forward because this is not sustainable. 
um, on any conceivable level. And we're going to see accelerated negative health outcomes as a result of it. Um, and so we, we really do need to address this with the seriousness that, that it deserves. Um, and I just want to, on behalf of the entire body, express my deepest appreciation to the people who are on this field <laughs> trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents uh, and be as creative as possible under the very challenging set of policy circumstances that you all find yourselves in. And hopefully, if we can address some of those core policy issues, that will help address recruitment uh, and retention. Um, but this is an all of the above, all hands on deck situation, clearly. So uh, there will be follow up. This was just a briefing. Um, but needless to say, if there are things from a policy perspective that the county can do, uh, we continue to encourage our partners um, in, in our hospital systems, as we have in the past, uh, to, to work collaboratively together. And I look forward to the follow-up. This is an ongoing conversation, clearly. Um, I see no other questions or comments from colleagues. Ms. Clemens Johnson, was there anything else you wanted to add? Or Ms. Farag, as we wrap up. All right, then with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all Thank so much. You. Thank you very much.